about 30% of AML patients have an FLT or FLT3 mutation. We are here to talk about a FLT3 axle uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It's being evaluated in a dose escalation dose expansion study of patients with relapsed refractory acute myeloid leukemia. And to do this, I am talking to Dr. Alexander Pearl, who is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the Pearlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. So let's talk about the agent first off that you're studying. What do we need to know? This is a highly potent drug in terms of its effects on FLT3. The, the, the drug has been developed to be very selective for the effects on FLT3, uh, which basically is, is a big improvement in the field because the earlier developed FLT3 inhibitors were very broad in their kinase selectivity, and that contributed to side effects. The second thing it's been developed to do is to be very potent against the target. Uh, because we think there's a strong response between a, a strong association between the, the ability to inhibit FLT3 activity and the anti-leukemic effects of drugs in this class. And the last thing it was designed to do was to work both for FLT3 ITD mutation and also D835 mutation, which occurs as a resistance mutation when we treat patients with some of the previously developed drugs. So you were enrolling patients into one of seven dose escalation mm -hmm. cohorts or concomitant dose expansion cohorts. How did those work? Um, it's a complicated mm -hmm. study design, but actually a really interesting study <laughs> design. Let me ask you about it, that. It's a first in human study, and so we wanted to figure out safe doses of the drug. But we also have a really good correlative assay where we can look at patients taking the drug and say, are we giving a biologically active dose of the drug? And the way we do that is we draw a plasma sample prior to therapy, and we compare that to plasma samples taken during therapy, and that, that's an assay called the PIA, or Plasma Inhibitory Activity Assay, uh, developed by my colleague Mark Levis, who's a co-author on the paper. Um, and basically, with the PIA, we can say, are we giving enough drug to inhibit FLT3? And you need a lot of inhibition for us to say we're giving enough. So on the dose escalation, while we're figuring out what's the side effect profile, is this a tolerable dose, we can say, is this a biologically active dose? And we did that for all the doses that we looked at. So the, the, the primary endpoint of the study is safety, of course, figure out whether we can give this drug at all and what might be the tolerated doses. But we also wanted to know what are the biologically active doses, so then we can look at the combination of pharmacodynamic data, meaning the drug working on its target, and the clinical efficacy. So the study, took any dose that was either biologically active as measured by the PIA or clinically active as measured by responses and expanded that in phase two. And we were able to do that concurrent with dose escalation. So we had multiple doses going through phase two expansion while we were cranking up the doses and figuring out, is this a safe dose? Can we go any higher than that? Is this better to give more drug than lower amounts of drug? And so we actually treated a large number of patients because very early on, indeed the first patient who completed 20 milligrams, the first dose level, was in complete remission, and we saw it had actually very, very good inhibition of target. We expanded every dose level on this study, except for the very highest dose of the drug, um, because we ran into dose-limiting toxicities. So from 20 milligrams to 300 milligrams, we expanded them all. So tell us about the patient population you were studying. This is a heavily pretreated group of patients. Um, they're generally treated with, uh, in, in patients who are fit, they're treated with very aggressive approaches. Typically, we will give induction chemotherapy with or without consolidation, and then a bone marrow transplant for those who are eligible. Uh, so if you look at the prior therapies, uh, everyone was required to have had prior therapy for AML. Um, and if we looked at how many prior lines of therapy, 70% of patients had had two or more lines of prior therapy. Almost 30% of patients had had a prior transplant for their leukemia. And a quarter of patients had had a prior FLT3 inhibitor before going on the study. Because again, we're trying to see if this drug works against resistance mutations to other agents. So, so they're pretty find? heavily pretreated. Um, this was a very well tolerated drug, and that's the first thing I would say. Um, this was a drug we were able to easily dose escalate. You know, again, we went through seven dose levels to right. see its, its uh, side effect profile. So we saw activity at the first level. Um, we were able to go up to 15 times that dose. Uh, it was still tolerable at that level. Um, we ultimately decided on a final dose of 120 milligrams based on expansion of a lot of patients at the 120 and 200 milligram doses. And we have data that at 80 milligrams and up, effectively every patient saw abrogation of their FLT3 signal in the correlative assay. So we know we're giving FLT3 inhibitory doses of the drug to pretty much every patient. Um, the drug has a long half-life, which means you only have to take it once a day. Um, and again, the side effect profile was really quite you know, well tolerated. Um, we did see uh, 
you know, hepatic transaminase elevations with some regularity that we think were related to the drug. We did see some patients with fatigue, some patients with diarrhea. But outside of that, these were generally grade one, grade two toxicities. It was uncommon that patients had to, de had to discontinue therapy because of toxicity. Um, and there was no important safety signal that we saw in terms of QT prolongation or other serious toxicities that we saw, again, with any regularity. Um, and then lastly, the response rates look really quite good with the drug. Um, if we look at the overall response rates of patients with FLT3 mutation treated with 80 milligrams and up, uh, about half of the patients actually achieved an obje objective response. The uh, response rates in terms of what's called a composite CR, or meaning that really the desired response is with less than 5% blast in the marrow, elimination of circulating blast, and some degree of hematopoietic reconstitution um, was seen in about 40% of patients treated with the drug. And, and those really stack up quite well against other agents in the cohort. Lastly, the thing that I think is most impressive here is that the durability of response was really quite good. The median survival for patients treated at 80 milligrams and up was 31 weeks. Um, and the number of patients who went on to other therapy that we might think would account for that, such as a transplant, was relatively small. So we really think that the benefit of the drug comes from the drug itself. Uh, only 14% of patients went on to transplant after gilteritinib. So we don't think that this is just you get into a response, you go to a transplant, and then the transplant gives you the survival. This right. seems to be coming from the agent itself. So survival appears better than expected for this patient population, would you say? Yeah, and we're, and we're testing that in a phase three study. So again, we've gone from first in human to phase three all in one trial. So a very Which efficient design and, and pretty impressive. I was struck when we had the first patient treated and we did the dose escalation teleconference exactly. and the patient went into remission. I don't know of another drug for any indication in oncology that's done that. So I'm really you know, quite excited about this drug. I really think it's doing quite good things. So overall, you're very encouraged. I'm very encouraged. Um, we're, we're obviously participating in the phase three study. We think it's a really exciting study. Um, it is open to patients with FLT3 mutations, whether they have FLT3 ITD or DA35 or both. Um, and it is comparing 120 milligrams of gilteritinib as established from this study against uh, the investigator's choice of one of four different uh, salvage chemotherapy regimens that would be expected to be standard of care for first relapse of AML. The reporter in me always wants to ask, when are you going to have some more data? Uh, these are the final results from the study. Um, so we're, we're you know, at the point where we have presented these data in preliminary form at a few meetings, um, but we're pretty much here. So for phase three. Yeah, so we're going to wait for phase three on that. There's a few other trials that we're developing the drug in just to look at where else we could use this. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, as I said before, a preferred management strategy is to uh, treat FLT3 ITD mutant patients with not only intensive chemotherapy, but also to go on to a, a, a allogeneic transplant once they're in remission. A question that many people in the field want to know is, is, is that enough therapy? Because there still are relapses after transplant. Probably about 40% of patients who get a transplant will actually experience relapse after transplant. Um, who have a FLT3 ITD mutation. So there's going to be a randomized study comparing gilteritinib after engraftment to placebo. And the drug, again, is well enough tolerated that we can do a placebo-controlled trial in that setting. Another place that you know, we're interested in developing the drug is in combination with agents. And there are ongoing studies looking at that, both in combination with intensive therapy, so seven and three therapy uh, for upfront therapy is currently in phase two. Um, we've just cleared the, the phase one uh, portion of that study. Um, we don't have any data on that yet, but we are exploring the phase two. Uh, and very similar story in terms of we were able to dose escalate without much difficulty and we came to a final dose that is pretty much the same as what we saw in single agents. So we're giving good doses of the drug that we think are going to hit target. Um, and that's combined with intensive chemotherapy, post-remission therapy. Patients can go to transplant and get back on the drug after transplant. And so once we really have more data there from that trial, we'll be able to say, can we basically do what was done last year with the Ratify study, which is to say, is that better than what we're doing as standard? We're not quite at the point where we can do that because we need to complete this study in the phase two setting, but that would be the logical next thing to do. Well, we have a lot of exciting news from ASH, so please look at ASH Clinical News as well as online. And for uh, ASH Clinical News, I'm Rick McGuire.